takes a minute. Okay. It says it's now streaming live. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, Senate Education, April 30th, 2020. Um, this is our remote delivery system for committee hearings. Uh, welcome, Senator Ingram. Hi there. So um, today's subject as the agenda lays out is child care, the rules surrounding um, the amount that parents are being asked to pay is one question. And then another question is, given the realities that parents are supporting in part the child care system through the pandemic, is there something that the state can do to reimburse them? The idea that um, we've put forward so far as a tax credit. And so we're gonna get into that second. But the first issue that I wanted to talk about is um, where this all started. So Debbie and I have a constituent who wrote to us and my understanding prior to that person's email was that parents were being asked to pay 50% of their normal tuition bill and then the state would pick up the other 50%. If that bargain was kept, then the child would retain their slot. And when the child care opened up in the not too distant future, we hope, their spot would be preserved. Um, but the email that Debbie and I got said that um, at least one child care provider had um, put forward a slightly different policy uh, which was encouraging parents to pay 100% of their normal tuition bill if they could afford to do so, and then 50% if they could not afford to do so. And this person felt caught in, a, in a, an ethical dilemma where technically speaking, they had the money to pay for their normal tuition, but they had other places that that money could go given that they weren't being provided with childcare. So my question for, oh, and I do see Stephen Berbeco. Uh, Stephen, are you there? Deputy Commissioner, Agency uh, of Human uh, Services. Um, not sure if you heard that intro. Uh, no, sir. Uh, okay, um, I, was, I was framing up why we set up this hearing and it had to do with a misunderstanding, miscommunication, or it may be the committee's misunderstanding of what the guidelines are around. Excuse parents. me, Senator Baruth. Yes. There's someone, uh, I've admitted someone to the meeting with just a phone number that I'm not familiar with. So I think we need to check in with who that person is or else I have to have, leave them, kick them out of the meeting. Okay, so it's a phone number ending 127? Yes. If that yeah. person can identify themselves? Yeah, it's me, Senator Perchlick. Uh, okay. Ah, okay. Okay, that's Andy. Thank you. Great. Oh, could kick him out off, please. <laughs> so, <laughs> so back to where we were. Um, as I understood the guidelines, and in talking to people, it seemed as though uh, informed people agreed that the guideline was that parents would pay fifty percent and the state fifty percent, but um, uh, as we'll hear from Mary Jo Sleeper, there were organizations that were working from CDD documents that had the impression that they were supposed to encourage parents to pay 100% when they weren't actually receiving their childcare. So I wanted to first go, if we could, to uh, Commissioner Berbeco. Uh, do, have I pronounced that correctly? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, um, and ask if you could just summarize the policy and answer that specific question. Uh, the policy about paying 50%? Yes, and is there a, a parallel drive to encourage parents to pay 100% if they can? Um, well, in brief, I'm, I'm not aware of um, any guidance that we have uh, sent out. Let, let me back up. If, if I can. Uh, for the record, I'm Stephen Berbeco, uh, Deputy Commissioner for uh, Ch Child Development Division, uh, Department for Children and Families. Um, good afternoon. Uh, 
Chair and Senators. Uh, I'm joined here with uh, CDD Policy Director, Melissa Regal Garrett. Um, Welcome. And uh, to your question about the contribution that parents uh, make for providers that are closed and taking advantage of the, or participating in uh, the stabilization program. Uh, the stabilization program um, offers providers 50% uh, of uh, tuition uh, for uh, children who are uh, would otherwise be in the program, uh, but the program is closed for the time. Um, and uh, parents are uh, asked to contribute up to 50% of tuition or 50% of child care subsidy. Um, less any uh, amount that is contributed by uh, Act 166 or any existing uh, scholarship programs that the provider uh, can take advantage of. Okay, and that was my understanding, but um, in a minute I'll go to Mary Jo Sleeper who works at the Edge um, here in Chittenden County. And she shared with me a, a frequently asked questions document from which they drew their guidelines, um, which seems to me to give both messages that parents sh should be encouraged to pay the full amount. And if they can't, um, and in a minute we'll ask um, Mary Jo about that, but um, any, any uh, memory from either you or Melissa Regal Garrett about that uh, frequently asked questions document? Um, I'm not sure about the document in question. However, when the stabilization program uh, was first introduced, uh, we asked parents to contribute 100%. Uh, yes. It's possible that um, a provider or family uh, may be looking at an outdated document. Um, where the, the recommendation is or the request is to pay 100%. Okay, if I could then, let me just switch gears to um, Mary Jo Sleeper. Mary Jo, I, I did just introduce you, but um, if there's anything else you'd like to say by way of introduction, go ahead. And then if you could just speak to how you developed your guidelines and um, is it is it a uh, outdated document? Um, I don't think it's an outdated document. This was the second document round we received um, after. So this con contained information about what we should be asking parents prior to April 5th and then post April 5th when um, the policy changed, at least as far as I was aware. Um, I work for the Edge Sports and Fitness. I was the former director of the South Burlington Kids and Fitness location and now I'm on the executive team there and I oversee all three locations, um, trying to keep a cohesive program running in three different towns in Chittenden County. Um, so the frequently asked questions document that I have that I shared with Senator Baruth yesterday, um, question number 15 says, should we be asking families post April 5th to pay full tuition or to pay 50% tuition? And the answer on this document says families are encouraged to pay full tuition to keep their spots and support their providers. State will pay 50% of tuition in COVID-19 COVID stabilization programs and providers may choose to charge up to the remaining 50%. But throughout this document in several different questions, I don't need to read them all. I'm happy to share it with whoever wants to see it. It does say that we should encourage the families that can continue to pay to do so. Um, we certainly gave families all the options um, and we allowed them to either unenroll to do the 50% or to continue to pay us. We never intended to provide or produce any more stress during this time. We really was, were trying to do what was best for our families while holding our obligations to what information was being shared with us. So I don't know if you'd like to respond to that, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mary Jo. Um, certainly, we want to give providers the full range of options when uh, talking with families and supporting families during this closure period. Uh, if there are families that would like to pay 100%, uh, and I've talked with some families who are doing that for the provider, uh, then, of course, they're, they're welcome to do that. Um, well, it, if I could just break in, there's a, there's a difference here between 
if a family would like to, and being told by your provider that the right thing to do, that the state is asking, is to pay 100%. So it seems to me, at the very least, a muddled message for the state to set 50% as the correct level that parents should pay, but then to have some operations encouraging 100%, others saying the guideline is 50%. When we come to Allie Richards, uh, Allie has been keeping a good systematic eye on things. She didn't see anybody really else doing 100%. So I, I guess ultimately a question for us would be, what is the state's interest in encouraging people to pay 100% and at the same time issuing the 50% guideline? Um, because they, they aren't receiving the service for that money. Uh, absolutely. Senator, I, I apologize. Uh, and Mary Jo, I apologize for the confusion in that guidance. Um, this is the first time it's been drawn to, to my attention. Uh, and I can assure you that uh, we're going to work to clarify that uh, for providers and families uh, going forward. Um, and uh, to your question, uh, is the state's interests uh, I believe, uh, to support providers and families as much as possible during the closure period and give them the full range of options for uh, how we can uh, make sure that providers are made whole uh, during the closure period and how they can be financially ready on the end of this closure period to reopen uh, for children and families. Uh, I, we certainly didn't intend to create confusion and, and I apologize for that. Um, again, we're going to take a look at those documents uh, and make sure that we can issue clarification uh, so that going forward, um, things are clear for providers and for families. Well, thank you. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, it seems to me, and I'm, then I'll come to Corey, that 50%, uh, you know, we're talking about thousands of dollars. Um, so 50% for a service not being provided is a great sacrifice to the state and to the childcare system. And I think parents should be commended for 50%, but to ask anybody to pay, um, the person who brought this forward um, has more than one child. And so they are paying every month uh, in excess of $2,000 for a service not being provided. Um, so Senator Parent, Corey, you're muted. Sorry, I, um, I would have, you know, CDD look at all their documents. One of the biggest complaints I'm getting is from child care providers, and it's not just on payments. It's when are they opening? What are, you know, they just feel like they're hearing one thing one day and something else the next day. I don't think there's a lot of clarity um, for them, and it, and it puts them in a tough spot, especially as parents are going back to work. You know, I was on the phone with my child care provider today just they, were, they had a lot of questions and, and we're all gonna have questions because you know I have a two-year-old son. So when things open back up, my wife and I are gonna need to figure that out, but nobody's getting good answers on anything. So I think this is just, I know this is on payment, but it just seems like it's, it's a pattern of a, a lack of clarity going out mm -hmm. into the communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, uh, do you wanna to respond to that commissioner? Uh, if I may, uh, uh, Senator Parent, uh, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I wanted to reassure you uh, and the other senators that uh, we are uh, working on our communications. Um, we have had to, uh, frankly, uh, build this new stabilization program and the uh, supports for it uh, very quickly. Um, and whereas um, a structure like this, I, I would prefer to have months, if not uh, over a year to put in place, we were putting in place in the course of a few days. Uh, unfortunately, one of the pieces that we weren't able to shore up as quickly as we would have liked was the communications piece. Uh, I'm glad that we have a communications team now responding to providers and families. Uh, they are providing responses typically within 24 hours. Uh, and we are also being proactive in our communications, uh, sending messages out to providers across all the providers so that they know the latest about what's happening and, and what's, uh, what are the new developments in the program, uh, and also targeted uh, communications to providers to let them know if they've submitted an invoice 
uh, and if that invoice has been flagged for further review and when they can expect to hear from us. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned reopening, and that's something that we are also hearing a lot about. And I wanted to uh, reassure uh, you, Senator Parent, and the other senators that uh, we have uh, a team of our staff who are working together with colleagues at the Agency of Education and Vermont Department of Health to uh, develop a plan for reopening with recommendations based on uh, health and safety recommendations and, of course, aligned with guidance from the governor's office. Uh, we um, we are excited to be uh, looking at the other side of closure, uh, and uh, we are very excited uh, to look at how we can support child care providers um, mm -hmm. so that when uh, they can welcome children back to the programs, they can do that in a way that is safe uh, and also financially viable for them. And just to put in a word, I, I feel that your agency did yeoman's work um, in a very, very fast um, and efficient way. I was amazed at the entire spectrum of education from what you're doing to K through 12 to higher ed to see everybody in a matter of two weeks make the shifts they did was groundbreaking. What we're trying to do is help the agency um, you know, find some of the stress points and, and unkink them before they cause too much, too much uh, discomfort. Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, yes, I was just looking at the, at the um, um, department divisions uh, webpage and I just wondered, um, Mary Jo, wh which document were you reading from the frequently asked questions for child care programs? Yes. Is that the one? And it, I, I was um, amazed to see that it's 11 pages long. Uh, which, which, which one were you? Um, I it was question number 15 on the frequently asked questions that I have in front of me. I know they've, they've come out with several of them, so I'm not 100% sure it's the same one you're looking at. I know I sent the copy of it to Senator Baruth. I'm happy to send that to you. I'm not so tech savvy that I might hang up on this call if I try to do that. <laughs> <I will. laughs> Gonna be honest with you. <laughs> I, will, I will send it to Jeannie and have Jeannie uh, send it out to committee members. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I just wanted to say also to um, uh, Debbie Commissioner Rebecca, I mean, I, I've um, had her testimony from him a couple of times um, on the health and welfare committee and and um, we do appreciate I you know we I, I don't want you to think that we're um, you know trying to try out to get the uh, division or, or that we don't understand how difficult it's been in this crisis to do things so so quickly um, we we are here to you know just to to support the administration and um, make sure that our constituents are, are looked after um, but we appreciate very much the job that you and your whole di division have been doing so thank you so commissioner uh, oh go ahead ruth well i can i can wait if we want to hear more from the commissioner um uh that's fine or okay from, uh, deputy commissioner <laughs> yeah just wondering uh if either um mr berbecker or melissa regal garrett have anything else they'd like to add and then um i'd like to go to ali richards and then to linda january for um you know, their, their responses to this. Well, Senator Berth, if you wouldn't mind, um, we submitted a memo and I'd like to offer uh, a slight clarification on that uh, to avoid any confusion farther on. I'm sorry, did you say you have submitted a memo? Yes, sir. You mean since we've been talking about this? Uh, no, sir, um, okay. uh, earlier today. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. Um, would you, Can you read the relevant part of it to us or? Uh, yes, gladly. Uh, so the memo uh, includes, among other things, a discussion of a uh, rough data analysis uh, that we conducted within CDD uh, because we wanted to find out more about uh, what the uh, effects of our uh, policy have been on childcare. Uh, and uh, and I want to offer the caveat that uh, this is a very rough analysis. Uh, the data set that we're using uh, is um, 
uh, the set of invoices uh, that were um, submitted uh, between certain dates. Um, and uh, from those invoices, uh, we were able to generate some uh, very rough conclusions uh, about, or at least suggestions, about what's happening right now. Um, the invoices show that, uh, at least uh, for the time period that we reviewed, uh, that there were over 4,000 children uh, who were included in the stabilization program. Now, I wanna clarify, that doesn't mean more than 4,000 children are currently receiving childcare as children of essential persons. That includes children who are receiving care as uh, children of uh, essential persons, as well as uh, children who are uh, counted among the uh, slots in closed programs that are participating in the stabilization programs. Um, when I read through the memo in preparation for this hearing, um, I, I caught that uh, and um, gave myself a little kick uh, for not being clear. Uh, and I didn't want to cause any confusion to uh, the senators or to your constituents. Mm -hmm. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, all right, if, if I could just go to Allie Richards. Um, so Allie, uh, CEO of Let's Grow Kids um, and someone who has had an eye on the system as a whole. Are, are there other programs that you've noticed who are um, mistakenly encouraging 100%? Um, Hi, yeah. So uh, this is Allie Richards, CEO of Let's Her Kids. Thank you very much for your attention to this and um, for inviting me in. So um, let me just say a couple things about this conversation as I'm listening to it. So, you know, I uh, I wouldn't say mistakenly, Senator. That's the that's the thing about the guidance. I think, and I'm curious to hear from Linda as well um, on this. What I think this is a tricky situation. I think that is the bottom line. Um, the state has a finite amount of money, and this is an incredibly expensive program. As we all know, COVID is shining a light on the absolute fragility and nonsensical way we set up childcare in the first place, right? It's not a public good. It's a publicly funded system. It's a system of the have and the have nots. Uh, it's a bad way to do business. And we all saw that with stark you know, relief when the pandemic struck. So this is a bit of, um, you know, a symptom of that. Uh, this is a private pay system where parents are already paying more than they can afford. And it would have not probably been in existence if not for the stabilization program as one of the tools in the toolbox in Vermont. We're seeing um, childcare, like 50% of childcare businesses closing in some other states. It's really a dire situation. So I just need to kind of give that context of um, the state swiftly stepped in as you're acknowledging uh, many of you on this call and um, provided a tool in the toolbox, which is the stabilization program. Now, what we have, and, and it, the idea is it's a spectrum. You know, since there's not a finite amount of money and it's a private pay system, if you would like to or can pay 100% as a parent, you may. The state's only gonna reimburse 50%. So that's where almost everyone's settling. And if, if you wanna pay or can only pay less than 50%, there's actually an option for that as well. A provider can accept less than 50% if they make up the rest of the cost somehow through a corporate scholarship some have or other funding or fundraising that they that they have so there are a variety of options plus some may close furlough their employees and go on unemployment and not you know then they don't have money for rent and stuff but that's a better option for some so i'm just trying to lay out the idea there's a spectrum of payments in the stabilization program and a spectrum of options for child care program and in some it's allowed this industry to not go bankrupt over the past six weeks. So that's the good news. The bad news is it's a lot of confusion. It's very complicated. And to Senator Parents, you know, point two, it's it's also very hard uh, for parents who are paying um, as well. Even the 50% is, and you said earlier, Senator Bruce, it, that's a lot of money. Um, I'm paying for two two kids at 50%, you know, right now. So um, so that's the, the thing. What we're seeing on the ground is there are some issues as we're hearing from, um, from Mary Jo and others, but in most cases, the childcare programs are talking to their parents directly. And they're saying, you know, you can pay 100%. And I will tell you almost every conversation ends right there. No, I can't do that. Okay, no problem. You can now pay 50% and we will get reimbursed and made whole by the state. And then they will say, oh, it's a stretch, but I'll do it. Or they say, I really can't. 
and they either unenroll or they'll do less if the program can allow it. So what we're seeing is most cases, programs are able to have this in-depth, quite comp complicated and customized conversation with each parent that goes on that whole spectrum. And I will say the guidance does, does clearly say, you know, that, uh, you know, they're encouraged to pay 100% if they can, because the state only has a finite amount of resources. So I do believe it is that, sc that scale, but most providers are trying to do best by the guidance and best by their families and where they're finding a middle ground. So I really am curious to hear what Linda, you know, feels as well. But um, I will say on the ground, that is sort of how that is shaking out because there are so many options. I will say another thing that you can actually um, apply for childcare financial assistance right now. There is a period also of looking for work um, that you can, uh, if you are unemployed, for example, but you, your financial situation has really changed, you can apply for CCFAP now, but you'd be using up your looking for work um, requirements. So Linda shaking your head, so I'm curious about that, but that is something we've um, we've asked and, and sort of pushed on. So, and we're seeing in some cases um, that be an option. So that's just to lay out sort of a spectrum of, of how we're seeing it shake out. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, then I will say what's happening in, to Senator Parent's question, all of a sudden, the, the good news is we were really in a place where we were roughly meeting supply and demand for essential personnel. And a lot of that was um, for because of the stabilization program um, and because of this added incentive that the state had, um, you know, and we're getting them emergency supplies. So, you know, 30%, I believe, of all childcare in Vermont was engaged in some way caring for essential personnel, um, which is really impressive. So there's a success story there again none of this is without its challenges for both the providers and families. This is complicated stuff. This is a pandemic. Nothing is perfect and clean in this. Um, but I think what's happening in the last week or so is that people are starting to think about the reopening and it's caused this sort of next wave of panic. There's also been a lot of misinformation we've seen over the past couple of days that's really been fueling the fire, especially public health misinformation that's been tearing through the community a little bit. So we're starting to offer some webinars um, with the Department of Health to start to get ahead of some of that misinformation on the public health side, how to reopen safely. And you know, the, the state is really carefully trying to think ahead. There's this, this chicken and the egg problem, you know, Senator Parent, about you need to, this is so complicated. There's all these questions about, can I go back? What does the stabilization program look like when we reopen? Do everyone must reopen? You know, what is the health piece? Can they have access to, um, you know, the medical equipment that they need to do this? There's so many questions um, that have to be answered that it's actually really a relief that they're signaling that June might be the time. So we have some time to reopen. But in the meantime, there's a real rub for more people going back to work, needing childcare before all these questions are answered with reopening. So there's just a real complex situation there. Um, but it, you know, I think we're gonna see plans, draft plans for reopening that will allow the field to you know, get some of their questions answered and be part of that um, in a way so that it actually is rolled out you know, as smoothly as possible given such a complicated situation. I'll leave it at that. Okay, okay. And, I, and I will come to uh, Linda January in just a second. I just wanted to speak to the, the idea that the state could use the parents paying 100%. I think that is true, um, but is there another instance, I can't think of one, where there's an industry in trouble and we're relying on consumers to pay 100% for a service that they're not getting? So we have hospitals around the state that are in trouble and private practices because they're not getting the amount of, uh, you know, surgeries and other things that they would normally get, but we're not encouraging people to go pay 100% for services they're not receiving at the hospital. So, you know, the idea that it's only encouragement to parents to pay 100%, personally, I think that's, that's wrong. It's, it's, uh, it's far more than I would have ever imagined that we would ask people to pay thousands of dollars for something they're not getting because the state wants to preserve uh, a must keep industry. Um, but to ask them to pay all of it, even in the form of an encouragement, seems to me a mixed message, number one, but number two, just above and beyond, uh, even for parents of means. So uh, Ms. January, um, jump in anywhere you like. <laughs> um, 
Hi, I'm Linda January, the Executive Director of Otter Creek Child Center in Middlebury. Um, they did submit some testimony, but I think I will address some of the things that have come up. Um, you know, our my organization, I'm, I'm uh, really thankful that my board has taken this kind of per phase and on a month by month basis and we're making decisions um, you know, we had a meeting last night to make our plan for May, um, and we'll meet sometime in May to make our plan for June, but um, that has really been helpful to think about it that way, um, and stressful. <laughs> I also want to thank um, the amazingly hard work that CDD is doing right now to keep this field afloat. I do not envy any of them. <laughs> Um, and with that, I also have to acknowledge that although I'm internally grateful for the financial support, it has been an incredibly frustrating experience to navigate. Um, when that second phase of the stabilization came out, um, you know, that after April 6th kind of phase, we got the information that there would be a phase two um, that asked us, you know, if we continued to pay staff and had parents pay 50%, um, they, that the state would cover 50%. And then if they couldn't pay 50% to unenroll families, um, and then the state would cover 100%. And then days later, we got clarifying guidance on that, and that's the guidance that Mary Jo was referring to. Um, and so for me, I kind of took the first bit of information and made decisions based on that. And when I talked to families, I talked about the 50%. Um, the guidance around the 100% came after the fact for me and was kind of too late for me to make decisions. Um, it also, you know, when you receive an 11 page document of guidance on a program and then talk to your colleagues and realize you still have um, probably another four pages of unanswered questions. Um, as a collective in Addison County, we kind of decided to interpret the way we thought it was to submit our invoices and see what happens. Um, and if our invoices were wrong, we had the kind of the faith that CDD would reach out to us with questions and ask us about what we were doing and why we were invoicing the way we were. So as a collective down here in Addison, that was kind of the approach after having several weeks of really intense um, meetings around what are we doing and how do we interpret this and how do we get our answers? And we just kind of came to the decision that we, we just gotta, we gotta communicate with our families and we gotta do what feels ethical and right for families and for our programs um, and our teachers. And if there was kind of, um, if we were doing it wrong, the state would reach out to us and let us know that we had did something wrong. Um, so far that approach has worked. <laughs> And so we um, currently have had five families unenroll who can't, or five children unenroll um, who can't make that 50% payment. Um, the one family, one of, they unenrolled one child and kept the one child enrolled because their older child was also receiving uh, UPK dollars and their 50% their copay after universal pre-K was $26 in some sense a week. So um, that child was affordable to where their infant would have been $144 and 26 cents a week. And that didn't seem um, affordable for them. So they un unenrolled their infant and kept their preschooler enrolled for the time being. Um, the really hard part of the conversations with families was around that unenrolling piece. Um, families felt 
very discouraged. They were very fearful um, about the potential of losing their spot. Um, just a lot of anxiety around that. Um, getting the spots are not easy. And so now they were in this position of facing a financial hardship and feeling like they were being punished because they couldn't afford to pay that 50%. Um, and we have been told that new, um, new applicants to the financial assistance program um, weren't being processed unless the family uh, qualified for essential care. Um, so that so in a normal situation, if we have a family who's laid off, who can't afford, they could apply for financial assistance through uh, the CFAP program um, and qualify for family support. They would receive subsidy to support them. Um, but because you know, we were told because they aren't essential workers and don't qualify and not receiving essential care, that they wouldn't be able to receive um, to receive subsidy at this time. Um, so that was kind of a double whammy for some of our families. Um, for the month of May, we really took a close look at our finances and um, made the decision to apply for the payroll protection program. Um, and that will allow us to re-enroll the five children who have unenrolled and to support families to pay for their, um, to support families in paying for their 50%. We will still access the stabilization program and um, use our PPP dollars to um, help families with their 50% and then still continue to pay teachers at 100%. And June right now is feeling like the Black Lagoon. Um, there are so many unanswered questions. Um, and I'm thankful that the Child Development Division reached out to providers yesterday um, around a survey about reopening and what that possibly could look like and what are our concerns and fears and is it even possible for us to reopen with the um, health restrict with the health guidelines and restrictions that will be put in place for group care? Um, but it is really daunting um, to think about and very overwhelming. Um, and I know for us, we will have about you know if we're told we can come back um, in June at you know, and there's no restrictions on who can access that care, we will have about 12 children that we will have to say that we cannot, that cannot return um, in order to meet the new uh, group sizes. So, which also means we won't be able to bring all of our teachers back. So um, some really big, difficult decisions are going to be needed to be made in the next month. Um, Senator, you're muted, Senator Bruce. Thank you. Um, Mary Jo, before we move on to questions, would, would you like to speak to any of that? Um, well, thanks for sharing, Linda. And, I, and we have a lot of, of things in common right now and a lot of feelings and um, with the uncertainties and the unknowns. Um, we, I think, I want to commend the CDD for all of their efforts. Um, I don't want to minimize all you've done to support us and support our teachers. And I hear consistently from our teachers and we have um, over 120 between the three locations that are just so grateful to still have a job. And our parents are grateful to still have the connections. We've been you know, doing things remotely and trying to keep connected with the kids as much as we can. Um, our biggest fears right now are also about going back and doing that safely and what is that going to look like and our teachers are asking us and our parents are asking us and you know we too are looking at numbers and ratios we have um you know our each of our sites is licensed from between 105 to 176 kids and um 
we're going to have to cut numbers. And I don't know how to do that if everyone's prepared to come back. And I don't want to wish that some of my families can't return because they either won't have a job to go to and won't need childcare or won't be able to afford to come back. So um, yeah, I don't think anyone necessarily has the answers right now. I just want everyone to make sure that we um, as a united front of centers have time to prepare to get everything in order so that when we do go back, it's as streamlined as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. um, one of my big concerns, and I'll make this brief, is just that the June 1st date, and I know that's still way in the air, I have a number of teachers who have school-aged children who have nowhere to send them between June 1st and June 15th because they should have been in public school. So they're all asking me, well, what do I do with my child so I can come back to my classroom? And um, so just another thing for everyone to be thinking about when we set that date. I know that there's summer camps that are closing and everyone's gonna have to reevaluate anyway, but I do know there was no programming set for those first two weeks in June for school-aged kids. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good reminder to the committee. That's an issue that we have to have on our radar screen is the reopening of the K through 12 system. Um, I assume everybody saw the announcement from UVM yesterday that they are planning to go back in September. So it looks like se September is shaping up to be a much more normal point in time with the various caveats of, we don't know what the virus will look like. We don't know what social distancing guidelines will be necessary, but it seems like September 1st for higher ed is starting to be a firmer date. Um, K through 12, uh, I'd like to have Secretary French in next week to give early thoughts on the reopening of the K through 12 system and what that might look like. Um, questions for anybody for really any of the witnesses since this is the beauty of Zoom. Uh, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Senator Baruth. Um, and just a quick note on what you just said about K-12 schools opening. I, I really agree that we need to get some testimony. And I had a brief conversation with the deputy secretary this morning. Um, so it'd be really great to, to get testimony as early as possible so we understand the process they're using for potentially maybe uh, opening schools. Um, and then uh, I um, will just want to thank all the witnesses and, and uh, you know, uh, Melissa and Steve know that I've been in close contact with CDD about all, all of these issues. And um, they've been working super hard under really difficult situations um, since the very beginning of this crisis. So I want to commend them for all the hard work they've done. Um, that being said, it's not been without um, complications. And I think one of the big complications that I identified really early and as is showing up in this call is that the, the guidance changed so quickly that it was often difficult to figure out what was the most recent up-to-date guidance. So I'm not surprised that there's confusion about this 100% versus 50% thing. Um, and that a lot of guidance early on was not dated. Um, so it was unclear which was the new guidance and which was the old guidance. Um, so um, you know, the fact that Mary Jo and Linda both had different sort of interpretations of things is not surprising to me. Um, so uh, I guess my, um, first of all, I wanna give a shout out to the Addison County child care providers and Linda being the representative on this call because they've been working really hard together to do um, interpretations that are consistent across the county. And I think that that's been fabulous. And one of my big concerns about all of this is that it's clearly been inconsistent across the state. And so some parents have had the benefit of their child care center really working with them and trying to figure out what works the best for their financial situation, their family situation, and other centers have not been or other providers have not been able to or um, working with families to do a more customized approach. And um, looking at this testimony that um, Deputy Commissioner Berbeco submitted, it looks like 24% of children not on subsidies were unenrolled from childcare, is that correct? And if so, that's a huge percentage of kids 
who had to be unenrolled because their parents couldn't pay the 50%. And that's really concerning to me because that means that those kids won't necessarily have a, uh, a guarantee. And Steve, I'll give you a chance to respond to that, but it won't necessarily have a guarantee of childcare when, when their parents are able to go back to work, even on top of all the complications of how will, how will childcare actually even function. Um, so uh, this has been a concern of mine from the beginning is that it's this very unequal um, interpretation across the state and an unequal um, uh, sort of administration of it across the state so that um, depending on where you live and who your child care provider is, you're getting a completely different story. Um, and I do want to ask Mary Jo if she's gone back to these families who have paid 100% and said, actually, you could pay 50% and the state will pick up the other 50% um, so that those families are not put into this position where they're paying much more than other families. Um, and then just wanted to highlight um, the, the opportunity that Linda mentioned about the payroll protection program and how that is available to child care providers, and I know many in Addison County have taken advantage of that in order to be able to help their families even more, and wondering if um, CDD has worked with child care providers to make sure they're aware of that and help them um, take get access to that funding. So as my questions, Steve, are about the data, if you could maybe walk us through this data to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly, um, and then what you're doing about the PPP program with providers. Um, and then Mary Jo, if you're, if you're going back to families and trying to work with them around this 100% thing so that there's more equity for families around in your program. And then- um, Ruth, can finally, we-, can we Let's just stop it at three. Okay, okay. all right. So, so Steve, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Hardy. Um, so the, the data that uh, I provided uh, show that or suggest that 24% of uh, children who are not on subsidy uh, were unenrolled in this time period. Um, and that's with the caveat that this is uh, an incomplete data set. Uh, and also when we say 24%, that's 24% of children who are not on subsidy. So it's not 24% of all children uh, were unenrolled. Um, uh, overall, I believe that number is uh, 18%. Um, but it's still oh. 706 kids, yes, right? Absolutely. That's a lot of kids who've lo just lost their childcare. And we we are uh, we wanted to learn more about who those children are, uh, and so uh, we looked into um, again the the data that we could generate from or the yeah you know, the data that we could generate from the invoices. Uh, and uh, um, looked at different age groups and see to see how this policy uh, affected different age groups. And what we found was that for uh, children who don't receive subsidy um, and were unenrolled, that the older children were unenrolled at a higher rate than the youngest, the infants. Uh, and that suggests uh, that uh, perhaps the, the market generally, uh, the child care market is more favorable to uh, slots for older children than it is to uh, slots for infants. And certainly that's the experience of many people that I've talked with and, and my own experience uh, as a parent uh, that I, I found and many other people have found that it's much more difficult to find a slot for uh, a younger child than it is for an older child. So it's possible uh, that some families looked at uh, the, um, uh, what's going on right now uh, and uh, going into the summer and planning for uh, the fall uh, and uh, looked at uh, possible elementary school plans or uh, more generally uh, the availability of slots for older children um, being more readily available uh, than for younger children. Uh, and Ali may want to uh, contribute a little bit to that conversation because I'm, I'm drawing some of my knowledge of it from surveys that Let's Grow Kid has, Kids has done. Um, Actually, Steve, uh, um, if you could, because we're, we're on a finite schedule, if you could speak to Senator Hardy's question about the 
PPP program? And is uh, your department engaged in actively promoting that to providers? Thank you for that question. Uh, I'd like to defer to uh, Melissa in answering that question. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, committee. Melissa Regal Garrett. I'm the policy director for the Child Development Division. Um, so the payroll protection program from the state's perspective, um, there's no reason why uh, providers couldn't be applying for that program um, and potentially using that in conjunction with our stabilization program. Uh, what we are not uh, clear on is what the federal uh, per, uh, parameters around that program are and what those opinions are. And we've actually heard uh, from a variety of different providers, uh, some that are using it um, and others that uh, opted not to use it uh, based on uh, different advice that they had gotten uh, from the federal um, perspective. So we chose um, to kind of uh, keep ourselves out of that and let that be, um, as this is in fact a um, market-based system, let that be a case-by-case -case decision uh, by providers on accessing those funds. Um, I would like to point out uh, a letter that um, Deputy Commissioner Rebecca and uh, Commissioner Ken Schatz uh, uh, provided for providers uh, to use with their families um, uh, on the 50% aspect of this program uh, in an effort uh, to help providers uh, have a tool that they could use that would help uh, clarify for families what that expectation was when we shifted from phase one uh, of this um, program to phase two of the program. Um, and I'm not sure, Mary Jo, if you um, uh, saw that uh, get distributed when we distributed the FAQs, um, but that is available for you um, if that's helpful at this point uh, in your communications with families. Ms. Regal Garrett, is it, uh, am I assuming right from what you said that that letter does not contain the encourage 100% language? I believe that's correct. Okay. Um, if I could, uh, MJ, if you would like to um, answer Senator Hardy's question about, am I right in assuming that you haven't gone back to the 100% parents, let's call them until you get clarification from CDD to do so? So when we encouraged them in our letter we sent, um, two, twofold. We did send them clear, um, three clear options as to what they could choose to do. Um, you know, when we took those, the verbiage we used directly out of the information from the FAQs that we received, we also included the link to the letter I think you're speaking about, Melissa, um, in our letter for parents to read, be able to read as well with that guidance. Um, we did have fam a number of families reach out. Um, now we have over I think 350 families right now. We didn't call them all personally. Um, everyone that reached out in response to the email that I sent, I personally responded to. I gave them all my cell phone number and I did talk to a number of them about what their options were. Um, when Senator Bruth brought this concern that he had received from a parent um, that goes to one of our facilities to me, um, that was earlier this week. I've sort of been waiting for this hearing to figure out if we should in turn submit another email um, retracting that guy. I just, I, I send so much information that goes one way and then the other. I just wanted to make sure before I reached out again that I was crystal clear on, on how you all would like me to do that. But I'm happy to do that, you know, however you see fit. I would recommend a subject line on that email that says, state clarifies, you pay less. Um, okay. So uh, Deputy Commissioner, if, if I could ask, as I, I heard you say earlier that you would be clarifying going forward, if you could keep us in the loop on that and send us any of the new documents that come out, that would be much appreciated. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's, we have, uh, it's five of three. We're scheduled to go until 3.15. We have another topic, related topic, but are there any final questions on this aspect? That is the guidance 50% versus 100% for parents. Okay, so not seeing any. Let's uh, shift a bit. So in the same set of discussion, 
uh, discussions with the same parent, um, I talked with that person about uh, whether or not the state could at some point compensate parents for the help that they've provided in stabilizing the child care system. Um, and so we eventually started talking about a tax credit. I was able to talk to the chair of finance this morning about the idea in concept form. And she seemed fairly receptive, asterisk being the state is in bad financial shape, uh, et cetera, and so on. But the idea of providing um, perhaps a flat one-time credit uh, for parents of so much per child, let's say $500 per child on next year's filing, um, that was the, the basic concept. And it would be a way for the state not to fully com compensate those parents, but to say, we recognize the sacrifice you made to help preserve a system that was essential. Um, so I, I'm hoping to get, uh, we haven't talked about this as a committee, so I'm not sure of my committee members' feelings about it, but um, if we could table that for just a second and maybe hear first from CDD, what your thoughts might be, and then from Allie and the providers. Um, so let's take it in that order. Um, Deputy Commissioner, any thoughts on that? Senator Burns, uh, have you been reading my email? <laughs> oh, no. D is this an idea you got under consideration? Um, I, well, it, it's certainly nothing. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's anyone uh, on this call that would be against the idea of supporting uh, families with their childcare needs, including financial support. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so CDD has spoken. Uh, Ali, thoughts on a, um, with, with the parameters to be worked out, but if we took the basic concept of a, of a child care credit for parents who paid 50% or more during this COVID emergency to be realized on next year's filing. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I want to just really commend you and the committee for thinking about this because as you just really heard clearly, um, you know, we, we all cannot sugarcoat the fact that parents are really in pain here financially and even, you know, 50% is a lot. Um, and those who couldn't afford that, you know, lost their spaces in some cases. So I do think that um, your right to be hitting upon this odd fact because of the nature of the system and the importance of childcare, parents are burdened with basically supporting the system through this when many other industries haven't needed that. Um, but it's been a reality of the situation. So yes, on the concept, uh, the idea of a tax credit, you know, you might think about a couple other alternatives Two, um, one being, you know, this idea that, you know, Linda was mentioning, they, they're thinking about the PPP as a way to get those, those families who probably need childcare the most, who had to unroll because of financial situations back into their program. So this does not help those families. It's almost like a, almost like a um, double jeopardy mm -hmm. for them. They lost their spot and now they're not getting the money back, um, you know, in that. So that's one little loophole you might consider that this doesn't mm -hmm. really affect. So other ideas that you might do instead or in addition um, could be something like a scholarship relief fund for families. You could signal the same idea through a scholarship relief fund using maybe CARES Act dollars that it could be used in this way right now. Um, it would sort of fit the profile. Um, so it would be a signal to some of those families that actually you could get some financial relief and get back re-enrolled instead of just losing the space. Um, mm -hmm. You could also increase CCFAP reimbursement rates, which is a trend we all need to be thinking about and doing anyway. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so right now, for example, the 125 per child per week, if you're doing essential care, all the things you just heard from this call about the additional needs when reopening comes in, you know, the idea of, of increasing CCFAP would really help a lot of those things, including families pay and access this. So it would be a break uh, to ongoing break to families that could be sort of more concrete uh, as well. And then the other thing you might do is I mentioned the CCFAP, clearly there are um, 
some hurdles with that that Linda mentioned, but you know, you could actually expand the amount of time. It's a state decision to expand the amount of uh, time where that you can be uh, seeking it's the work search eligibility determination on CCFAP. So in other words, you could say right now it's 12 weeks where you can get healthcare financial assistance if you're looking for a job and unemployed. You could expand that uh, during the crisis so folks mm -hmm. could have access to CCFAP uh, when they're looking for, you know, they're looking for work if they've been laid off um, and they're actively seeking to look for work. Those are just some little ideas that you could consider maybe in conjunction or instead mm -hmm. of a tax credit. I think the idea is wonderful, Senator. You've hit upon a key problem here, which is that parents are paying a key role um, and burden um, in keeping this alive. And I do think there are some slight loophole, loopholes, the lag time, and also this 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 group of, of uh, vulnerable yeah. Vermonters yeah. that are losing their space. Yeah. Well, I, I, I take your point. I guess the people who lost their slots because they couldn't pay have a different problem, um, which needs addressing, but you know, maybe two, two targeted solutions operating in parallel. Um, how about uh, MJ or Linda? Would either of you like to speak to that? Linda, you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, I would, uh, I think anything to help families um, would be amazing. And mm -hmm. a lot of what Ali said, uh, you know, the increase to CFAP, not only the increase of rates, but also expanding that eligibility mm -hmm. uh, would be huge for both programs and um, families. Um, I think whatever it is, it needs to be really um easy and straightforward for families and providers. So if we're having to um, provide families with evidence or with receipts or whatever, that that needs to be a really easy process mm -hmm. um, with clear guidance ahead of time. So there isn't a lot of confusion and lag time for folks to get the yeah. funds. Yeah. And uh, I did, um, have a brief conversation with Abby Shepard, who's on the call um, about this. And what I spoke about with her is something that would be as easy as possible. Um, so something like uh, a $500 per child credit that is there regardless of, uh, you know, so it wouldn't be progressive. It wouldn't be um, attempting to, you know, I, I take the point about the, uh, the, the money and the eligibility, we could broaden those, but if we do that, we run into questions about going forward, ongoing costs. So this would be a one-time uh, attempt to, in a certain symbolic sense, mostly pay back parents for helping out during this time. Um, and it would be limited to a one-time, a one-off deal. Um, so, I would like to speak to the committee about this. All the witnesses are welcome to stay, um, but if you have, I know the um, CDD people probably have pressing commitments elsewhere. Um, so if anybody would like to leave the call, we're gonna have committee discussion for maybe 10 minutes about this topic, uh, but feel free to stay on as well if you like. And thank you all. Thank you for the time. Sure. Really appreciate it. So committee, um, that's the, the basic concept. Um, and as I say, Abby will have something for us to look at next time. And I take Allie's point about um, there being other approaches. Feel free to, if one of those things she talked about seemed like something you wanted to develop go ahead and do that. I'm thinking that next week on Tuesday, at this time, two o'clock, we have a, a hearing where we take a look at what Abby's come up with and we start talking through some of the inevitable um, complications as you get in to the idea. Anybody want to weigh in on just the, the concept um, as, as rough as it is? Senator Ingram. Um, yeah, I think the idea of giving families some kind of relief is 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 great and and would be um, a good uh, expression from the state. Um, I'm not a big fan of tax credits just in general. Um, 
because they're they their payments way after the fact of the money that's already been spent and they're also um um you know they're only for people who can afford to, to shell out the money originally anyway so they, you know so i i'm not a big fan of tax credits the the ideas that i heard that i liked more um was the scholarship relief fund especially if some if especially if that money could come from the federal government um, mm -hmm. i think that would be great um and then I'll, and then i definitely am a big supporter of putting more money into ccfap um you know in general and and um increasing the the subsidy rates um but um i mean that would be but i hate to only do that for one year and then not have the money you know going forward so if you're really thinking of only like a one time kind of thing yeah i, think I would prefer like some some kind of scholarship relief and especially if we can get it out of federal, federal yeah money. if i think if we can get money out of the the feds we should we should pump it all in this would be an addition to to that um mm -hmm. uh, because i i don't think well uh, it's it's unclear whether it's lost revenue or whether it's a uh, and a payment that the state wouldn't have otherwise had to make um so that'll be a question we'll ask going forward um if we if we think about it as a scholarship relief thing inevitably it would be means tested, all of the, the aid now for good reason goes to um, families at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum and that's as it should be. I was thinking of this as something that would not be means tested in the way that when you file your taxes, you get a $500 tax credit for your child regardless of your income level. Um, and so I was thinking of this as the same sort of thing because the, the people, as we heard, who have been asked to pay 100% are the people who can afford it. But you know the letters that Debbie and I got from this family um, make it clear that while their income level is higher than others, they don't feel that they're uh, wealthy enough to pay a couple of thousand dollars for a service they're not receiving. So that's, that's a big sacrifice that they've made to the state. This is just an attempt to offer them something back regardless of income level um but the tax credit yeah, yeah. Would, sorry would be structured i mean you you would to qualify you would have had to have your child in child care though right i mean not just yep. as a child and you would have to show that you paid more than 500 dollars uh -huh. during this period mm -hmm. so even if you were a, a parent who couldn't pay 50 percent if you did pay 500 or more you'd still be eligible. That's my thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that should get you down to a fairly low income level. Um, there was another hand I thought. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, no, I commend the idea. I think it's it's the right thinking, but I worry just about making the decision now without having all the, the data in there. Like what number are we talking about? Is yeah. it? JFO, JFO is working on that. Right, so that would be good, and then so then once you have that number, it's like okay, what is the best use of that num of that money, and is is kind of fixing this wrong the right thing to do, or doing some of the other things that just kind of are supporting the system going forward? They're like two different things, mm -hmm. so I don't really see them as comparable. Like increasing the CCFAP is very different than kind of helping these families that did something the prior year, and so I don't know how I feel about that but i'd kind of want to know what the what number is we're talking about because i know i yeah no idea. yeah and we'll hopefully we'll get a rough on that um on tuesday when abby comes forward with a draft um this is partly coming from my experience in economic development i i don't know has anybody in here been on economic development oh, corey has um it's a different world it really is um you know, in here, when we talk about a million dollars or $500,000, it's like, oh, no one would ever give us that kind of money. In economic development, it's like every single session, three million, four million, um, often in the form of tax credits. Mm -hmm. um, and tax credits, for maybe obvious reasons, are easier than increasing the amount that childcare providers get or 
increasing the amount that we feed into pre-K going forward. So, um, but the, the, yeah, so, the so main, in, sorry, so, just, just to finish the thought. So in one sense, it's coming from a place of procedurally in the legislature, it's easier sometimes to pass a tax credit. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I, I get that. And it, but I, I support tax credits as a way to get positive action to happen. But in this thing, we're, we're yeah. not changing action. We're not using it the way to try to get economic development or, or get people to do something they would normally do. We're, we're trying yeah. to fix this wrong or say like, thank you for, for making that extra sacrifice. So that's why I'm not sure it's the best use of yeah. the money to support the childcare sector, if that's the goal. But if the goal is just kind of like a symbolic nature, I think you even said, then then we should just be clear that's what it is. And the only other thing that I kind of worry about is this, I, I couldn't think of an example right now, but is there another sector where like, oh, well, if you're doing that for the, this, this sacrifice that these families made, what about X, Y, Z, others that made a similar sacrifice? Well, that's what I was trying to think of during the meeting. I can't think of any other place where the state is expecting consumers, you know, it would be like, we're gonna lose a lot of different businesses and industries, but nobody is saying uh, that consumers should provide money for a service or a product that they're not gonna receive because we want those industries to be there in two months. Yeah, I thought of it, it's like asking us all to buy airplane airline tickets now. Right. <laughs> We're not right. flying somewhere. Not, yeah. <laughs> and the airlines are okay. I would make, do that to help the airlines. To make the analogy perfect, you'd have to say, we need you to buy a ticket to California. You can pay 50% percent, but if you have the money, it would be great <laughs> if you pay 100% and don't go. Um, I don't know, right. <laughs> you know. um, yeah, Ruth and then Corey. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with um, Senator Ingram and Senator Perchlick that I, while I think we should do everything we can to support these families who've had to put out money for something they're not getting during a crisis and that it's entirely unfair. Um, and I, yeah, the airline analogy is great, Debbie. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm concerned about a, a tax credit as the way to go. I, I think that in many of our committees, and we've had this conversation in here, we've been talking about like, how do we moving forward fix a, a system that's broken and this is one of the most broken systems that we need to really fix is our childcare system. And so I really like Ali's suggestions about trying to put it into a scholarship program or a C, the C, uh, expanding the CFAP. <laughs> I always get the letters mixed up. Um, and um, potentially using the federal money. I also, I, the, the, the people I'm most concerned about in a lot of ways are the people who were not able to pay and then lost their childcare slots. And, and so this wouldn't help them at all because they have not been able to pay the 50%. Um, and you know that's 900 families or something like that and probably even more. And so uh, the scholarship program would help them and, um, and the increasing the CFAP, even if we can only do it for a year, at least it's, it's during a year of when our state is recovering for, from a, a crisis. So I think that it would still be worth it. Um, and I am concerned a little bit about the, 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 the regressivity of just a blanket um, tax credit um, because mm -hmm. the families who've been able to pay the 50% are the families who can afford it the most. And the people who haven't been able to pay and who've lost their childcare are the people who haven't been able to afford it. And I, and I also just want to caution that the constituents that you guys heard from who were required to pay the 100% or, or did pay the 100%, I think they are a minority. I think most childcare providers worked yeah. more with their people to not have them pay 100% and did what um, Linda January was saying was done in, in her her facility was that it was really working with families to help them pay as little as possible, but still manage the program. So I, I, I'm concerned that there are programs that ask for 100% and don't think it's, a, I think it's a, an exception, so. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I, I would just say to clarify, everybody's lost their slot right now. 
right? I mean, nobody's nobody's getting childcare except children of essential workers. So everybody's equal. The question is when we start up, will those people actually not have a slot? In talking to several providers, it's become clear to me that, that their plan, Sada Voce, is to take back the families that they disenrolled before other families. So it may well be that that seven or 900 don't lose their slot, although they're technically disenrolled now. I guess all I would point out is that if the system exists when we come back, it doesn't exist because of the people who weren't able to pay. They didn't pay and they may well wind up with a slot when it starts up again. But if the program's there, it's because the people who did pay kept the system up and running and weren't receiving a service. So that's why uh, admittedly, it's not changing people's behavior going forward and it's not incentivizing what we want and it's not increasing the health of the program going forward, but it's a way of saying the programs wouldn't be there if these people hadn't paid for a service that they didn't get. Um, so with that, I, I understand the, the concerns. I don't think tax credits are broadly favored. I don't think that, um, I think everybody agrees if there's federal money, we wanna direct it into the programs in an ongoing way, as opposed to using state money. And I think everybody would like to increase the amount in the CCPIF program. Um, FAP. Or FAP program. <laughs> so, so what we'll do is next time, we'll take a look at the numbers from JFO, We'll look at what Abby's drafted. We'll continue this discussion. Um, I, you know, I'm not wed to anything except I, I would like to try to acknowledge the, the families that have paid um, and saved the system in addition to helping families that couldn't pay. So maybe it's two tracks that we're thinking of. Corey, last word and then we'll head out. Yeah, so I'll touch on, you know, Ruth brought up, so I'll, I'll expand a little bit, but, um, you know, with what we're seeing at the state colleges and pre-K and this, I really do think it's an opportune time for us to be looking at the full cradle to career method. And I know people like to look at these as three different silos. Mm -hmm. I see them as one silo. I think looking at that whole program, if, if we want to create something new, but short of that, I think, you know, your proposal, uh, Mr. Chair, is probably one of the few that can get through the whole body, if it can get through the the whole process. And I think we have to be grounded in the reality of, you know, what can we do to help? Obviously I'd like to get money in people's pockets tomorrow if we could, but if the best we can do is a tax credit for next year, I still think that's better than nothing. And I want to make sure when we leave, we, we head home with something, not nothing for these families. So I just would ask the committee to look at it through that lens. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much folks. I, I appreciate it. I thought it was, a, it was a enlightening hearing. Hopefully we'll have some clarification from CDD and we can take a look at that. Um, but barring that, have a, a good, well, I guess I'll see all of you at least three times between now and the weekend. So I'll just say until the next Zoom call. Debbie? Yeah, I was just, uh, so I was just looking at my email. So we, it, we have a all Senate call at four. Did everybody see that? Apparently. Four? Yeah, that okay. was that was really uh, that was like oh, quick okay. scheduling. I was <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Ruth, was there something you wanted to say? Uh, no, just that that we would see each other at four. Yeah. Okay. See you then, and Jim, see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Abby, thank you very much for participating. Katie, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>